You are listening to the Just Skimming the Surface podcast with Wes W. Skim Milk Skim. Just Skimming the Surface is a podcast that focuses on the stories, interests, and passions of people. Taking inspiration from late night talk shows, guests are interviewed on their experiences, providing the opportunity to reflect and grow. Behind every person's life is a journey to be learned from. No matter how deep we may go, there is always a way to look deeper, which is why we're only Just Skimming the Surface. Hello and welcome to the Just Skimming the Surface podcast. I'm your host, Wesley W. Skim Milk Skim. I'm here with Nolan J. Rice today. Hello, Nolan. Hello. Hello, Wes. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me on. Oh, not a problem. Always good to reach out to fellow theater artists, especially in the current pandemic we're in. So uh, oh, tell yes. me, tell me, how have you been um, surviving this current climate? Um, I think like still doing classes and everything like over zoom and online uh is keeping me busy i think keeping busy is an important way to like stay to stay sane i think because i've been doing classes but like now that i'm like away from uh a social environment like isu i'm sad i can't see my friends but i'm still getting like so much work done because like, i've been i've been reading a lot oh, i've been yeah. reading a lot more like plays and I think a couple of books. I probably read a couple of books at this point, but I'm still saying uh, productive and everything like that. That's but good. You're you're friends. one of those who could stay productive during uh, these events. I know oh yeah, it gets hard sometimes because like my last, like being in my at ISU, I didn't get to play <laughs> The Legend of Zelda, but now I spend most of my day <laughs> playing Zelda, and I get a lot less stuff done that day. So it still gets pretty hard sometimes. But oh yeah, yeah, I but, can understand. Yeah, but stuff still gets done at some point. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I feel you with having to keep busy. I, I've been playing so much Animal Crossing. And, and, uh, <laughs> oh, goodness, I've been, I've been playing too. it since it came out. <laughs> yeah. I've been on that one, too, just hopping back and forth. Exactly. And, and Zelda. And Surprisingly actually... similar games. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, depends on which one, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I feel you. Keeping busy is definitely important. I just, uh, I, in fact, just picked up a job during uh, during the pandemic. So oh, I my goodness. Where sort. at? What are you doing now? Well, right now I am back in the pizza business again, but at a different location. I'm at Rosati's, which is. Oh, really... not, not Domino's anymore. Yeah, no, I uh, wanted to try something new. Um, and the location that I usually go back to for Domino's is a little slow right now, so. It Makes didn't sense. need the extra help, so I'm trying something new. Next but, time uh, I buy Rosati's, I'll think of you. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 interesting being an essential worker. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like the line gets kind of blurry between what's essential and what's not. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, anyway, Nolan is a blogger online, blogger, vlogger, um, internet jogger. <laughs> what? I don't know. I was just coming up with rhymes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, Nolan runs a blog on nolanjrice.com. And recently he did an article on theater in a virtual world. So, uh, would you like to elaborate more on uh, that article? Us, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's nice to still like be able to contact your teachers and professors and peers that you had at school when you're still like working and doing school at home. But like, of course it still gets hard. Like, I, like you don't need me to have me as a guest to say, it's hard to like have acting classes and theater classes oh, when yeah. you're only like communicating through a computer screen. Um, so I want to like, and like all, all the plays are canceled. You know about that? Oh, of course yeah. yeah. That. Why am I it's saying a... that? <laughs> My play yeah, is canceled. <laughs> I'm going to try saying that again. Yeah, so many plays at ISU and like other schools, basically every school canceled all their plays for the rest of the semester. So it's getting a lot harder for uh, for artists and actors and people who and and writers to to practice their medium like in a public setting now that these plays are canceled. So a lot of companies are like 
I'm saying like so much. So a lot of companies are turning to digital play readings. And I actually saw like ISU alumni, Kristen Schoenbach, she started a, a play reading group. And I'm like part of another one that's from like another blogger set in New York. They have a play reading group. Um, the ISU RSO free stage like did a digital reading a couple of days ago um, of one of those plays that was canceled for the free stage festival. And I'm really, really happy about this because it still gives artists and actors and people who want to practice this medium. Uh, it gives them a way to express that while still like being at home and following social distancing guidelines. Oh yeah. Uh, and it, it, it matters. It matters a lot. Yeah, definitely. Uh, right now at, um, I'm at Glenn Bard West student teaching, um, this semester. Fantastic. And, well, we had, a we were going to be doing a Shakespeare show, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, and it. it's uh, it got canceled uh, because they kept extending the the closings, and we don't even know when we're going to open back up because they keep moving it the the timeline back further and further. And yeah, it's all such a wishy washy like deadline thing. Like you don't know when stuff's going to be coming back. We don't know if there's going to be uh, a fall semester yet for those yeah. plays and for yeah. that school year, which is very like. It's scary. It's very scary. Yeah, I mean, at times, like we, we can't. We had to cancel our show, and we had a black box uh, play series that we had to cancel as well. And um, it, it's just, it, it was kind of disheartening. We're putting together a uh, presentation uh, sort of thing of monologues and design pictures and everything, just to give them something to show off okay uh, the work that we've done so far but yeah when you don't know what's coming next and it, we're just taking it day by day it's it's kind of hard to stay motivated and to stay excited for what's coming next you know yeah and like motivation and excitement are like such essential things to have and at school when there's like a blocked out schedule of like this is when you have class this is when you have rehearsal this is when you can spend time with your your roommates and your friends when you have that kind of structure motivation comes a lot easier but now oh, yeah. that structure is gone, or at least like hindered for a lot of people. But for a lot of people, it's gone. So motivation's gone. Oh, yeah. And you have to like dig it, like start from scratch to like find why you care about doing this and figure out how it's going to be productive to you as an artist or a person and then work up from there. Yeah, I mean, it was just when everyone was posting about the shows getting canceled, it was reading through your, your Facebook feed. It was just so as a theater person, as a creator, it's just so depressing at that it's moment. It's so sad. It's, it, it was, it was very upsetting, but um, to be able to have the chance to do theater online, uh, some people are for it and some are against it. So I, yeah. I'm assuming you are for it then. I'm very well for it, only because, like, there's no other way. Well, probably a few others, but for the most part, there's no other way to, like, there's no other way to spread the messages of theater and the ideas of theater without, like, these digital play, play readings or professional companies um, posting, like, archived videos of their shows. Yeah. There's no other way for people to see that other than like reading plays which you were able to do before the lockdown yeah yeah and but these uh virtual play readings have been uh, a big help to creators to be able to just do something you know <laughs> just oh it really to... has been yeah i mean whatever way we can get our indulgence of theater while everything's closed uh, we'll take it <laughs> yeah we need to get our fill we need to keep on trying stuff and reading stuff and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really enjoying the um, the theaters that are posting recordings of their shows online. Uh, you, oh, I am too. You mentioned that. Um, I really like um, right now. I know Universal has been working with Andrew Lloyd Webber to uh, to post a bunch of uh, shows that he's done, like movies and then uh, stage versions on YouTube. Oh, is that right? And, I, I, yeah. I, have, I haven't heard about that, actually. You haven't? No, I've not. I've been looking at like national theater and the old Vic. The Globe is actually like week. I think a couple of days ago, as of recording this, they like 
they uploaded a video of their production of Romeo and Juliet. And like the week yeah. before that, it was Hamlet. I don't know what they're doing next week. I didn't know this was a thing until it popped up on my YouTube recommendations. Yeah. But I'm so happy about that. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> exactly. Like I watched uh, on YouTube, I was able to watch Memphis, the musical, the Broadway version and oh. Legally Blonde, the musical, the Broadway version. <laughs> it's just like being able to to go on and see those shows. Uh, we've been telling our students through cl- our theater class that, hey, here's some here's some chances to watch theater for free. Like you don't always get this opportunity. You and almost never Broadway get the opportunity shows. to. Yeah, they're Broadway shows. So yeah. it, it's, it's really cool. And like I was saying with the Andrew Lloyd Webber, there's a, a Universal has a channel on YouTube called The Show Must Go On. And they, oh, they like that. They've streamed. um They've streamed Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. They streamed Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, right now, I think, or not right now, but recently, like within the past week, they were doing uh, Phantom of the Opera. So <laughs> they're, they're all these stage shows that are available for 48 hours. You could just go watch them on YouTube. And like you That's said, so the convenient for, for everyone. Yeah, the National Theater is showing their, their shows. So it's it's cool that they're giving us this opportunity and in that aspect i've seen a lot of commentary where um people are stating that this this might change the whole course of of theater as we know it so um what are your thoughts on that i think it will change the the universe of theater and performing arts but not in an irreversible way and by that i mean like there's like before this primarily shows being performed for a live audience like from, from since the dawn of time but now there's like more digital performances that we can access for free without leaving the house and there's so much of more of that and less of the live shows that i think when the live shows do come back there's going to be some kind of balance in gray area between the two like maybe like more companies can live stream like their professional shows for audiences at home i think yes i i think what we're going to see is a t- to more accessible theater um regardless of your uh socioeconomic class whether you can afford it or where you are in the world i think um i think we might see theaters start to offer a um uh, a, a tier of ticket purchasing where you could just purchase a, uh, access to a link that will allow you to watch the show uh, video and that's recording. fantastic as long as like the theater that's like producing it is still like aware of that so it's not like there's people bootlegging tickets to everyone but like when it's structured it can be a really really beneficial thing for a theater to be more accessible to yeah, people I, who it wouldn't have been accessible to before the lockdown I definitely think it's a good move. I think it would be a great move for the theater world to do that because we're seeing so much drop in interest in going to live shows because of pricing. Um, tickets are getting very expensive. And so if if people are willing to pay uh, maybe a, a, a smaller price for a little less quality because it's a video versus being live in person, I think people will take that offer, especially oh, students, students of, of theater and um of of art and i always advocate for like i always advocate for like student rush tickets or ways to make tickets easier for or tickets cheaper for college students and and grad students and people who who need that for their education i'll always advocate for that yeah it'll it'll I think it's going to be fantastic, and I really hope we see that that change once uh, things start opening up again. Absolutely, like l- l- not even change. It's like just seeing the two worlds of like live theater and dig- like strictly digital theater. Seeing those two worlds come together, and like not like cut off one of, and not cut off one of the two for good. It's like having the two come together. I don't know what I'm talking about right now. I'm sorry. It's, it's all good. I, I know. I totally get what you're saying. It's just being able to offer that that extra access to some people. I think it's gonna gonna really help the industry, and I think um, it'll bring more interest from uh, younger audiences, uh, in yeah. that they they don't have to worry about being able to 
fly out to New York to Broadway and uh, paying these hundreds of dollars for a, a decent ticket at a Broadway show. Yeah, like a, um, a nosebleed seat, like 500 feet away from the stage. Exactly. So um, then it like opens it up for more people, like not even like from a socioeconomic standing, it opens up the gates for people who are farther away from the theater they want to see the play at. Exactly. I think I think we're going to see a huge change in not just the theater industry, but the entertainment industry in general. Absolutely. It's going to be so different. I mean, all, already looking at um, theaters, um, people are worried that some theaters aren't aren't going to come back after this uh, movie theaters. Yeah, some just don't have the budget to like get it back up and running after all this time of not making any money. Yeah. And it, it's. It's, I mean, it's been a big change ever since Netflix and Hulu, uh, Disney Plus are all around now. Everyone's kind of staying at home, watching a movie at home, saving some money. Um, a, a lot of theaters uh, don't see a lot of people coming in anymore. Yeah, um, it's, like, it's like, that's concerning. Like, And things like Family Video are like closing down too, I heard about. Because like already like Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, things like that are making things more accessible than family video can keep up with. And no amount of selling CBD can like bring them back up to <laughs> like work. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, like, I get no you. Amount I mean... of, like selling more things can get them back <laughs> up to the standard that they used to be at because people can just see movies and TV shows from the comfort of their home. Why would they go to family video? Yeah. I mean, you, you and I live in the same area, so I know exactly oh, yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, the, there's um, this family video in Round Lake that started selling CBD and literally <laughs> they were just so proud of the fact that they sell it that like they had 20 different signs on their property. about. Yeah, it. like there were signs <laughs> everywhere in the store too. I don't think I saw any more cars appear there that week. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, I, I think streaming services and are just changing to a digital age is definitely going to affect the entertainment industry in that aspect. And it's, it's, it's going to be sad to see movie theaters start to go. I mean, we already saw almost the death of drive-in theaters. Yeah. Um, there's only so many around now. We have one up by us in McHenry that's opening up um, the 1st of May. I believe they're trying to open up. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I'm yeah. so happy to hear that. though. Well, I think, I think I love they that. have, yeah, yeah, it's a great drive-in, and I think they have the best ability to reopen under these conditions because people are staying in their cars at a drive-in. Yeah. Uh, there's not too much worry about seeing other people. So I, I think there might be a chance of uh, us seeing a resurgence of drive-in theaters. I'd be so happy about that. And I'm not happy for the reason that it has to come back. It's still like oh. daunting circumstances that are putting everyone into hysteria and constant feelings of terror. But drive-ins are coming back. Yeah, <laughs> drive-in well, theaters make a return. <laughs> making a return. History repeats that. itself. <laughs> Absolutely, it does. So, and I, I've heard that um, AMC might be going bankrupt after this, and so we Ouch. we might see um, not just theaters, but a lot of small businesses closing after this. Oh yeah, there it's harder to like keep up their. Uh... It's harder for them to stay on top of like. Forgot I said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you can come. Uh, no, I get you. Way. It's it's hard. It's hard for them to to really know what's going. I mean, like like us, everyone's just hearing everything on a day to day basis, and it's kind of it's hard to live life like that right now. <laughs> really everyone is. wants to know what's happening. Um. So getting back onto the theater track of talking about performing yes. in uh, theater. Uh, what do you think are is some good advice for theater artists right now as everything's closed to uh, keep morale up and to keep performing? Um, oh my God, the best advice is to read a lot. Like in terms of productivity, productivity, my advice is just to read a lot more than you probably did before because you might not get the chance to read these plays in class because oftentimes people in class encourage you to read them in your own time. And this is your own time. <laughs> uh, 
because like I know coming soon, like I'll in the coming semesters I'll be in a class all about like Shakespeare scenes and monologues, and I haven't read that many Shakespeare plays yet, and now I have the chance to, and I'm so happy about them. Probably gonna start reading another one after we're done recording this. Hopefully, <laughs> we just like have. I'm gonna calm down. I'm gonna simmer down for a second. It's okay. <laughs> don't, don't worry, Nolan. I, There's I such can... a big floodgate of things, <laughs> of like plays and materials that you can read to study up on and perfect your craft, whatever that craft might be. So use this lockdown as a time to work on yourself and make yourself the best you that you can be without distractions to slow you down. Yeah, no, I agree. And now that... Uh... <laughs> talking about with the videos places are sharing free access to scripts to read yes it, it's a perfect time to to find a way to keep practicing to keep uh gathering more information on the medium yeah especially with the digital play readings because you don't even have to read those plays you can just sit and listen to other people speaking through the script and they care about it or else they wouldn't be there and the writer cares about it because more people are hearing that text and you care about it because you love theater exactly. because you love plays. Please go to the, <laughs> please just go to the uh, digital play, play readings, wherever you can find them. They're everywhere. They're popping up everywhere now. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It's great. All over Facebook. So definitely really Facebook is. is a great, great re resource right now. <laughs> it really is for connection. So I want I want to kind of turn the conversation back to you and what you do. You, oh, uh, NolanJRice.com. <laughs> um, tell me about how did you? Uh, what inspired you to start blogging? Um, to start blogging, it was actually based on an English project that I did my first semester freshman year at ISU because we were told to like expand our our abilities to be writing stuff beyond just like an essay that's due on Tuesday and then another essay due next Tuesday. So we were told to like try new things out. I tried writing a podcast transcript as my first idea um, because I was considering starting a podcast where I'd, I would read plays and then share my opinions on them. Okay. But that requires a lot of on-the-spot thinking. But blogging, I found, gives you more time to like really practice your writing skills and also get out whatever message you're trying to spread, and you can plan that better. Plus, it's easier to market if you're trying to market yourself. So I oh, wanted yeah. to stick to a blog. This is a place to like spread those ideas, like say what's on my mind. Sometimes it's about theater. Most times it's about theater, actually. But other times it's about... Uh... I write sometimes about confidence and about humanity and self-love. And they're really broad things to talk about, especially as a, as a pretending to be woke college sophomore. <laughs> so I tried to like make it, how do you say it? I try hard to make my posts easy to connect to okay. because I don't have all the answers. And my blog just makes it look like I know what I'm talking about and it's stuff that I care about. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I totally get you. I mean, that's a very similar to just skimming the surface, and it's a, keeping it general, and um, and and just really just reflecting on on what you enjoy and what um, what you think people can get out of it. Yeah, thinking about your audience and what they can like when they turn off the podcast or close the blog window. What are they going to be thinking about? Exactly. And, and, and if it's I'm like, making these messages accessible, going back to accessibility. <laughs> and, and, and it's really like, it doesn't matter how many people read or listen. It, 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 for, for me personally, it's, it's just like, I just want to do this. Like, I, I don't care if I have one listener or I have a million listeners. Like, yeah. this is something that I, I just want to do. And you just enjoy someone, doing this. Yeah. And if someone gets something out of it, great. That's fantastic. Yeah, you you made a mark on someone's life. Exactly. And that's something to always be proud of. 
if you do it in a good way, which you do. <laughs> thanks, thanks. An important clarification. <laughs> um, so, talking more about uh, your blog is is a lot about theater. You were saying. So, what right. got you into theater? I love thinking about when people ask me this question because it's not the most exciting story in the world. Um, <laughs> but there's a few stories about it. Uh, I consider there are three chapters of it. And the first is the first play I ever saw. It was 2009 uh, at the PM&L Theater in Antioch, Illinois. Ooh. And they were doing a production of Seussical. And I yes. knew nothing about Seussical. I only knew that I loved Dr. Seuss and I wanted to see my favorite characters live on stage. Because how... How freaking exciting is that, right? As a nine-year-old who loves Dr. Seuss. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I was I was over the moon when I saw that. And I remember after that show, actually, I went to uh, the guy who played Cat in the Hat. He came out into the, like, the lobby after the show in his costume. And little nine-year-old me was like, Mr. Cat, can, I, can you sign my program? And the cat was like, yes, sir, let's be sitting in my invisible chair. And he's like, sat on the wall and like signed the autograph. And I'm like, this is the greatest man I've ever met. <laughs> It was great. But then yeah. I didn't think about theater very much. But then for a minute, my brother did theater. He doesn't. He did it for a very short time. But then I tried doing it uh, when I was in seventh grade because, and this is the only reason why I started it in the first place, it was because it was a club that had cool t-shirts and I wanted a t-shirt. <laughs> and then I stuck with it because like we, what we do, the first play I did at Palomby was a Christmas carol. And I was a guest at Fred's party. And I had one line, and there was two <laughs> words. A tiger! That was my line. <laughs> that was my big line, seventh grade. I mean, whatever gets you into the field. If it's yeah, a whatever gets you, like, it's <laughs> whatever friendship. sparks the passion, whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, and then high yet. school came by, and it was at the end of, uh, this is where like, it, it, like, it actually started. Like, for real, 100%, this is what I'm going to do started it was after i think one of the closing nights of the last play i did in eighth grade before i was going to go to high school and this woman who had gone to be my theater teacher in high school her name is miss chusid opera chusid and she saw me after the show and she's like i heard you're going to lakes next year lakes high school and i just want to say you should definitely be a part of our theater program and i'm like what's I'm like, that sounds like a lot of fun. What, what's going to happen next year? And she said the musical is Beauty and the Beast. Ooh. So flash forward, we're auditioning for the show. Like, my first ever uh, musical audition ever in my life. And there was one day where we did a song and a monologue. And the next day, we all got together to do a dance that, was, that we learned from a video the choreographer sent out. And I tried for so long trying to teach myself the dance i have no dance experience i've <laughs> never danced in my life and i tried like teaching myself this video the choreographer made and i couldn't learn it <laughs> for the life of me so i just ditched the dance call oh no and the next day miss chusa goes to me i'm not even a student in her class she probably has no clue who i am other than that one kid she saw in eighth grade and she's like why won't you have the dance call? I said, I just couldn't learn it. and feel like this isn't the thing for me. And she said, Nolan, today after school, go to the theater room. We're going to have a student teach you the dance. And then she taught me the dance. The student taught me the dance. And I did it, I think, later on that day at callbacks. And there was like eight other people around me. So it wasn't just me alone doing the dance routine. It was like in a, in a little group. And then Miss Chusa was like, great, let's take a five here. Uh, you guys are great. You can go home if you want to. And I was walking out of the theater and into the hallway, and Miss Chusa is there, and she's like, "How'd that feel?" And I said, "It felt great." And I fell to the floor and I cried immediately <laughs> because I didn't realize how how like it's not intense at all, but it felt so intense then. I just didn't know what was going on. I just like walked out. I feel great, <laughs> and then immediately <laughs> cried. And then I got into that show. I was a, uh, I was a happy villager in Beauty and the Beast, and the rest was continuous auditioning and doing plays. But it started with that one terrifying audition at Lakes. Yeah, I mean the audition process can be very intense and very 
intimidating at times. But, it really uh, can be, especially when you don't know what you're going into. <laughs> yeah, especially your first audition. I totally understand. My first time auditioning for a show at um, Antioch High School was, I, I had no idea what a monologue was. And I was, oh, me neither. I felt I was <laughs> I was already in the hallway before auditions and someone was like, yeah, we have to do these monologues for, for auditions. And I was like, oh, what's that? You have to do a what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're doing so, what <laughs> so they gave me a, a copy of their mom did that and i didn't end up getting cast and i was like well guess this isn't for me and i didn't do theater my first year in high school uh so that was a uh, interesting time but uh, when the musical came by i was in theater from then on even though I still didn't know what a monologue was. <laughs> <laughs> you learned eventually. It's well, of course, thing. obviously. I'm a teacher of theater now. I have to yeah, know. Yeah, hopefully you know. <laughs> We're coincidentally doing our monologue unit right now. <laughs> oh, great. But um, that's just the way it is. It's very, it, and when once you're in it, sometimes it just feels like you're in it for life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, no and of matter course, how... you get used to it later on. Like, there becomes a point when auditions aren't nearly as terrifying. Like, if you're auditioning in front of, like, a high school teacher or a college professor or people you don't even know who, like, have connections all over the world, it's still just, like, you connecting to the people casting you. Yeah. And, like, you'll know that, like, if not that job, then the next job. So you stop thinking so hard about it and overthinking, oh, I'm good at it. I do it all the time. But yeah, it's, so, it's so counterproductive for you to overthink about it. And no Instead matter, of just being present. No matter how many times uh, you might take a break from it, it's so easy to just get back into it. It's so... Yeah. And it's so, like, fulfilling, you know? <laughs> it is. It, it is. And I actually saw... I saw Nolan in, in a show his senior year before he came to ISU. Um, it was... Uh, and I never saw another butterfly. Is that what it's called? Oh, you saw that? Yeah, I told you about that with uh, 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 Mr... Mr. Escavel. Mr. Escavel directing. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I didn't um, know you saw that. Oh, I'm so happy you did. I told you. So I actually saw it because um, we, uh, Dr. Chrisman was taking us, um, me and uh, one of the other uh, theater ed students up because he, he was going to see it. And he asked us, our class, like, does anyone want to come see it? And me and Emma, were, Emma Harmon were the only people who were like, yeah, we have free time. We'll go. <laughs> and like. I was just excited because it was in my hometown and Lakes is across the street from where I live. So, I was like, yeah, it is very, we, yes. we are very, very close by. Yes. So, we, we came up that day. We had chilies for dinner and then we went to, to, um, we went to Lakes to see that show and it was really good. And so, oh, I saw, I'm so I saw happy you went to see that, that what? one man, that one, <laughs> one night only show. I specifically remember this experience because, um, we, we saw that show and then your first year at ISU. I I saw you in in the APL and I recognized <laughs> you immediately and I freaked you out because I said I I bet you I can uh, guess where you went to high school <laughs> and you were you know, like if I what? didn't know you and like and you I... came up to me with a big beard and a a deep Wesley Skim voice and I didn't know who you were I would be terrified I pretended to um to to be psychic and I I was like <laughs> I'm sensing lakes community high school <laughs> <laughs> i and probably face, bought it too yeah your face was was priceless uh, <laughs> i had to have totally fallen for it that was a fun moment that was a fun it was moment for nolan his first week or so at isu <laughs> oh yeah you know i wouldn't go to isu if it weren't for mr Escavel. really yeah because for a long time like i was like doing more and more musicals at lakes and doing musicals in the area like with uh christian youth theater cyt but i really really loved doing musicals and i wanted to go to school for it uh so i had like a bunch of school it, it came senior year and i was like trying to go over what schools to go to and my top choice was columbia college in chicago yes. for musical theater um and then and there are other schools I, was, I wanted to go to for musical theater illinois state university for acting was my fifth choice school <laughs> because I was so hardcore set to do musical theater. And so they I did not have a program then. They did not have that program. They did not. I was only going to go to ISU for acting. 
And then Mr. Esquivel, I was talking to a lot because he was the director for Butterfly. And yes. then Mr. Moses, like an, another ISU alumni who uh, taught stagecraft at Lakes and still does now. Uh, he graduated, I think, 2014. I can be wrong about that. Oh, and awesome. I was talking to him about it at lunch during during my time at Lakes. And he's like, there are so many more jobs available to you after college if you get a degree in acting versus if you get a degree in musical theater. Because Stephen Stonheim said, oh my God, I totally forgot the quote. <laughs> what's the, what's totally the gist of it? You, you what, no, no, no. I tell uh, me what's, what's the gist of it? The gist of it? Any director would like to cast an actor who could sing over a singer who can't act. Yes. Oh, so I yes. should definitely focus my priorities on knowing what it takes to be an actor in theater and training that skill. And then if I want to keep on pursuing singing, to keep on going like with that as a, like a, a side burner to oh, acting, yeah. to the acting path. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's, that's a good outlook on it. And, um, I, as someone who went to Columbia and ISU, um, <laughs> I definitely, definitely think you made the right choice. Not saying that Columbia is terrible or anything. They're yeah, very just, different fields. Well, yeah. And Columbia has such, uh, it's, it's just so different from ISU. ISU is, it's, it's, it feels a bit smaller, which is good for me personally. It's more mm -hmm. tight knit. And Columbia was just so big. And it's so, so especially like being in the middle of one of the biggest cities in the world. Yeah. It's... And it, it was kind of clicky too, their theater program. So it, it, you had to have some sort of in with the people there or it, it, you just felt like an outsider. And that was, that was me until I was in the radio program there, voiceover and radio. So. It's uh, being the outsider is like such a and like being in a clicky environment, such a toxic environment to be in. And that's such a common environment in theater, unfortunately. It is. That's a, that's a sad truth. But like, and there are still like little, like you can tell like when somebody works together, like in a pair or a group for a long time, you can tell like they they get along and they can work together. Oh yeah. But like we're still like such a tight knit community at ISU. We don't even need like a theater fraternity or sorority like a real one because we're such a tight knit community. <laughs> it's one I of my mean, favorite things about the SOTD. We're all so closely tight knit and unified. Oh yeah. And it doesn't matter if you've been in a show with the people or if, if you hang out with them constantly, if you see them in the age, it's always a friendly conversation to be had. Right. That's what I liked about it. At, at Columbia, there were some people that I was scared to talk to because I was just like, I don't know if you want me to talk to you. I don't know <laughs> if you care about me, so I'm going to walk away. Exactly. But I mean, Columbia is great for networking. And that's that's. Uh, oh, it is. I mean, there's there's positive to any school you go to. But I think you made the right choice. I, assume. I think I did, too, especially yeah. like as an an undergrad, like coming from a small suburban area. And going to like a school mostly full of people who also come from suburban areas. So right now you are participating in theater as online classes. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience right now with that, with e-learning, with theater? There's no doubt that it gets a lot more difficult when when the class because like acting classes and voice and movement and things like that those classes at isu are like mostly about 10 to 15 to 20 people like very very small groups and most of what you do in class is so heavily relying on peer feedback and working with an ensemble oh yeah so when the ensemble is taken away it does get a lot harder to connect with uh other people who are doing the same assignments as you are. But still, the professors are giving you a way to like work independently and figure out how to still be a productive theater practitioner, actor, writer, whatever you may be. Yes. yes. Without being with the sad truth of not being around the ensemble. Hmm. It's a very sad thing to see, but 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 professors are still being accommodating about it by giving you assignments you can do on your own time 
and just setting a due date for maybe a week or a couple of days after the normal due date would be, because clearly you're in a new environment. You're going to be doing the assignment probably differently than if you were still on campus. So, so teachers are accommodating. What is something that has been difficult for you to uh, get adjusted to as we move to online for education? To adjust? Yeah, to to get used to. To, to adjust. adjust to. I'm trying to like pin down one solid answer. <laughs> it's all good. It doesn't necessarily have to be just one thing. True. I think one of the easier things, or one of the things thing, plays, texts, scripts, that I probably wouldn't have been able to find as easy if I were like at ISU and had a limited physical script library to work with. But I think one of the harder things to adjust to is just being by yourself and not being around your peers and your your peers and your professors and your teachers. Yeah. But being able to work by yourself is a good thing to adjust to. Yes, yes. I, it's like I a mean, hardcore wake up call for what <laughs> life might be like after graduation, trying to be. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, I mean, as theater artists, you have to be able to work as an ensemble and independently. So, yeah, it's a good experience. It's good. It's it's an experience. It's just it came in a very unexpected way. Yes, definitely. All right. So what else uh, did you have anything else specifically that you wanted to talk about? No, not that I know of. I shared my long epic odyssey about how I got into <laughs> theater uh, and how I got into ISU. And I think the only, if I had to like leave your listeners with parting wisdom or advice, at least that I, that I live with, is that staying curious and staying adventurous is a very hard thing to get into, but it's such a good way to live a rich life. And now we have all the time in the world, like maybe like aside from classes and doing video auditions or whatever you may be going through still staying curious and still finding new things to spend your time doing or experiencing is essential i think so and with making mistakes as well because maybe you're just walking down a pe- can i share one more story wes yeah go ahead <laughs> um this isn't like a a fair whatever but i was, I was like, walking down a trail and there was like a bunch of like little number cards going down the trail. And I'm like, I don't know what this is about. I'm not going to worry about this. But then one of the numbers, it was number three, it had a jar of strawberry jelly next to it. I'm like, I don't know what is happening right now, <laughs> but I'm curious now. I want to keep falling down this rabbit hole. So I took the jelly and I, like, I, I kept walking down the numbered path to see what it was going to lead to. And each number had like these little notes that are like, you're awesome love you and then i got to number 16 i was walking for a while i got to number 16 and there was a card that says i can't wait to go camping with you and i'm like oh my god this is this is someone's actual thing this is someone's anniversary gift or whatever (laughs) i'm definitely intruding on this now i feel guilty uh my moral compass is telling me to go back to number three return the jelly and go home (laughs) but while walking back up the trail um i was listening to my music I was jamming out. <laughs> and I think at number seven, there were these three girls there. And I got closer to them. They're all my friends from high school. Like, I know them. I've done choir with them. And they're like, Nolan? And I'm like, you guys? <laughs> and I didn't know what, I didn't expect it. I had no clue I was going to expect. And they're like, yeah, this is Ashley Scavenger Hunt. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> one, one of these items wasn't strawberry jelly, was it? And Ashley's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, here's the thing. And I pull my jar of strawberry jelly out of my pocket and back to her. I'm like, I'm sorry about that. Didn't mean to in- intrude on your 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 scavenger hunt. <laughs> and then I walked home. Now, it's kind of weird to pull a moral out of that story. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if there is a moral to that. It's just like, I wouldn't have like bumped into those friends and had that funny interaction and that story to share. If I just walked away from the bot- from the jar of jelly, or if I chose to turn around at 16, I just chose to like be adventurous, adventurous. I was walking down a 
freaking park trail. <laughs> but I was curious, so I just like fell down the rabbit hole and then used my moral compass to like help me get back from that because I wouldn't have stolen jelly if it was for someone else. But I'm just happy I ran into those friends that I wouldn't have run into if I stole if I didn't accidentally steal their jar of jelly. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, probably the most Nolan story I've ever. <laughs> <laughs> this was like I... last week. <laughs> it was last week. It was like last week. Oh my goodness! I told that story so many times already. <laughs> that's so. Uh... Yeah, I hope that's a a comfortable way to end no, your podcast not... episode. That's that's great. I mean, it's all about experience and reflection. We have to be grateful for any experience we have. Yeah, so. and then going out and finding the experiences as well, being the adventurer. Yeah. All right. And um, with that, I think we're just skimming the surface. I, th- I think we are too, Wes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nolan, for uh, coming on and talking today. And I think uh, your experience is uh, very helpful to a lot of people right now as we're going through the pandemic and through how do we live (laughs) going day by day in a virtual world as theater artists or theater practitioners and um how do we stay motivated and creative in such a time so thank you it's a very hard thing to do but i hope i could leave some kind of impact on your listeners and if not at least make them laugh with my strawberry jelly and my audition (laughs) story (laughs) <laughs> so thank you for having me, Wes. I appreciate you reaching out and wanting to collaborate. It means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And definitely make sure, listener, to check out nolanjrice.com for Nolan's blog posts. And he, he touches on a wide variety of subjects and stories and, and a, a very good uh, writer and very interesting conversations to be had there. So thank you so much, Nolan. Thank you, Wes. So happy I can join. And with that, we're just skimming the surface. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Nolan for coming on and discussing virtual theater with me today. I really enjoyed our discussion, and I really hope that you all got something out of that. And I hope that you're staying creative, even through these tough times for artists and creators. Thank you to Mousepad for allowing me to use his song Midnight for my intro and outro now. You can check him out on Facebook, Spotify, SoundCloud, and more. And definitely check out Nolan's blogs on nolanjrice.com. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great night.